No problemo, I say. Hey? Hey, hey. hey. there you go. Hello, hey, mate. Guys. It's a pleasure to have you on. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. You guys doing okay? We're wonderful, man. We're wonderful. Uh, yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> I'm wonderful. Johnny, not so great. <laughs> I've got a sore back and I just sold my house and the new buyers are being a pain in my butt. How are yeah, you, mate. more importantly? Nah, mate, uh, it's, you know what? I was just saying to Jana earlier that, like, I've just moved from, basically, yeah, we, got, we got evicted from our place in Brighton because the landlord wants to basically move back for the summer. Jerk. So mm. we, we're in the process of moving from here to another place. The other place hasn't had electricity for the last 10 days. So I have to come here to, like, do shit like this no no events um but like it's just constantly back and forth and yeah starting my day with uh the dog doing chronic diarrhea on our new oakwood flooring in the kitchen so my girlfriend wasn't very happy i wasn't very happy uh he's the how was house. the dog feeling <laughs> he had the shit slightly, slightly embarrassed i imagine with the shit yeah <laughs> isn't it weird like when dogs like uh, you know, doing something that they're not supposed to be doing. You can fully see like the and the embarrassment on their face. It's so transparent. Yeah, he, he looked when I came in and I gave him a bit of a bollocking and he just he just looked so sad. And I was like, mate, you should you you I would love it if I could just diary on the floor and walk away from it and go, oh, that's a shame, but I can't. <laughs> Stupid no opposable thumbs. That's my only problem here. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, I don't know what you're so excited about. How old's your dog? Eight. Oh, oh that's a good innings. What, what breed? A French bulldog. Oh, that's a problem oh, right nice. there, isn't it? Why is that the problem? They're notorious for problems. Are they? Anyone yeah. I know that has a Frenchie is notorious for problems. Shit problems? Or just all problems? <laughs> They're all shit problems. Just like fucking everything. Backs, <laughs> legs, nose, legs, yeah. ears. Nose. That's what I might Johnny's the same. Bulldog. Yeah. <laughs> if you were yeah, you're a French bulldog in your past life, <laughs> maybe I was. It explains a lot. Uh, oh, how long God. have you lived in this place? Um, the, we only moved here in August, so I, I, we just we my girlfriend wanted to move down to the seaside, so we just I rented my place out in London, and we just thought we'd try it for a year. We've got like eight months down. It's the process, and then this yeah, the situation has popped up. So. We're going to stay in the other place for another year, see what it's like, and then, yeah, maybe sell up in London and buy down here or something, I'm not sure. How do you enjoy the seaside versus the city life? I fucking hate London after oh. living here. Yeah. In, in terms of, like, we went we went and saw Book of Mormons yesterday, and um, and that was in, like, Leicester Square, which is, like, central, yep. central. And it was just rough, like, just so rough. And then, yeah, it, there's, there's definitely something about being down by the sea. I think it just brings out a better side of people. Um, everyone's really, really friendly. And, yeah, I think there's just something, I don't know about how, where, where you guys are based, but, like... We're right by the sea. Yeah, we basically live by the um, beach as well. Yeah. Amazing. I just kind of feel like if you're having a shit day, you go for a walk along the beach, you see how in, insignificant your problems really are compared to the fact of that's the ocean. I know that yeah. sounds like a bit hippie, like, you know, how small you are and how big this place is. So it's, um, yeah, and it feels way less claustrophobic, like when you're in the city and, you know, it's all fucking on top of you. Yeah. And, like, we were on the tube and shit last night. I was like, man, I don't miss this. We <laughs> from Man, which is like East London, and it's, yeah, still so Fucking busy. Intense, yeah. So friends and I were out. We went for a run on the weekend, like out yeah. in the bush. And he was like, "Imagine living in like Jenzen or like Shanghai. Just like you have no nature around you, just yeah. surrounded by skyscrapers and like industrial, yeah. and millions and millions of people." I, I can't imagine what that experience must be like having because I've always like kind of lived near the ocean and out by nature. Not being able to get access to that must be such a different way of life yeah and it's interesting man because like on the weekends like people descend down here in the summer so like bright yeah. so we live like we live more in Hull, but brighton station is like the whole 
anybody that can get a train to Brighton does. <laughs> and they come and yeah. they just fuck. We're, yeah, the, we're the same up. here. Like yeah. in Is summer, it... every Friday afternoon, every like Friday or Thursday before a long weekend, trying to get, because I work in Sydney, like which is about an hour and a half south of us. But when you're leaving, it's just the, the motorway from Sydney up to where we are on the central coast. It's just chockers. And you can just see there's caravans, there's boats, there's bikes, there's surfboards. Everyone's just packed everything they've got into their cars. And like, we're going to the beach for two days. It's just like, ah. yeah. Yeah, we're going to cover in that. Yeah. All right, man. Absolutely. But you're not going to have that experience when you come here because no. it's not quite the right season for the beach. No. <laughs> so it won't be too big. You'll still get the beauty of it. You'll, you'll have like a, an English summer when you're here. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the only places, if, if my memory serves me well, that will be near or by the beach will be Adelaide and Perth. I don't think we're anywhere near it. Sydney or Brisbane. Oh, you're within 15 minutes. Yeah, of the Sydney's beach still Sydney. close, man. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Bondi. Yeah. Yeah. You'll be right. You'll see it. Yeah. yeah. You're playing. Roundhouse is like uh, Randwick, which is one suburb in mm. from the beach. Oh, okay. Well, so the, the night of your show, you can go for a pre show dip if you want. I said, get in by, get in by a shark. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> there's been a lot of whales and dolphins around lately actually like the whale watching's oh, been yeah. really good man yeah they're all flocking north do they flock no, no you're birds. being a bird you idiot <laughs> oh, okay, up. yeah they migrate anyway but also you've got a new album to talk about as well congratulations yes. it's an absolute belter is this number nine eight uh number eight yeah eight um, i was including the live album wasn't i Yes. Fuck. What a rookie. So sorry. <laughs> so sorry. That's an impressive uh, thing, my man. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's something we talk about um within within the band about how like our main primary objective has always been longevity. And I guess like um you know you get to a point where it's like just we we, we deliberately try to do a couple of albums where it's like try whatever because it could be the last one sort of thing in terms of you know you never know when someone's going to turn the lights off on, on our operation but um we've been really lucky and like we've had very um what's the way i'm looking for i guess loyal is too obvious but like just very like understanding and understanding fan base like if we've made left turns they haven't just gone oh fuck that you're no longer good anymore do you know what i mean which is anyway um i think you're being modest or not giving yourself the credit you need i think you're as a band not just you individually but as a band willingness to take chances and and step outside your comfort zone is why you've had longevity you're just not bringing out the same album on repeat being like yep this works let's yeah, keep doing it 100 percent. you've always had the that you me vibe but experimented and done something different each time i think that's what keeps people coming back because they it's always going to be interesting and new that's weird, you man. Yeah, I mean, I guess like there's, I guess, but I guess that's also then um, just sort of just when you have five different songwriters in the band and there might be two or three pulling to go forward and then a couple being like, no, but we need to retain this. So then you get a nice mixture of the two. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, with Sucker Punch, it's very much like, you know, because we haven't been able to tour Sucker Punch over in Australia yet. So I'm looking forward to showing people stuff from that live and because that record has kind of got so many like so much versatility and and, and different like nuances to it whereas truth to k was very much more a bit more measured and a bit more considered in the sense that we said we're going to make uh a nostalgic yumi at six record but just frame it and refine it in 2023 you know and like have use the experience we've had from other records to hopefully keep it interesting but also have it feel familiar for people that are already fans of our band yeah and so like d cuts is like an interesting kind of case study in that sense of like it sounds like old school yumi but then still has all these little like nuances which keep it like oh yeah that sounded a bit like the stuff they were doing on sucker punch and it has a bit of this there and a bit of that there so it's got a bit of sinners there whatever so that was kind of the I guess the rhetoric and, and what we're going for. But um yeah, man, it's 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 look, 
that I've I've been I've been acutely aware of of some of my friends and bands that I've known over the years that have been would consider themselves lucky to have been able to put out two or three albums, you know. Yeah. Mm. So I've been able to put out eight and um maintain uh I guess the level that we have has been kind of a credit to our fans, but also, you know, just just been really lucky. And like, you know, it's a combination of a, a lot of things, but you know, it's it's a very rare thing for bands to get to as deep as we are. Um especially coming through like the MySpace scene like we did and like that sort of shit. So it's cool, man. We're yeah, we're we're stoked that we're still going. When you reference the MySpace era, it sounds it makes me feel old as fuck because like we were there for it. We've been with you since day one. And it doesn't feel that long at the same time. Like when I'm like, all right, eight albums, that seems like you put music out pretty consistently because you like it's not as though you've been around for 30 years as a band. Yeah, so I think we worked, so we worked out the like, so Tech Colors was 2008. So it's about an album every two to three years on average. So um, some solid consistency. <laughs> yeah, so there was a run where like we had a record 2008, 2010, 2011, uh, and then there was a gap for a while to 2014 that we didn't have a record for. So that's, that's what gave us a bit of time. But um, yeah, I think we just, it's one of those things though, right? That like when you've got like momentum is one of those things that you don't know you have it until it's happening. Mm. And you don't know how to keep it and it's very easy to lose. So it's like when you have momentum, which we definitely had across the first, I'd say three to four records in particular, it was like, we have to just, that's why I was like, do records, tour for 12 months, record for six, put it out, bosh, and just keep going and keep going. Yeah, do it again, do it again, yeah. Because yeah. cause once you've got yourself into a position where you're like, people know or are aware of who we are, and we've got some a currency, which means that we can afford probably another album or maybe another two albums or whatever like you've got to keep banging on the drum and doing it but um so yeah it's weird because there's it's weird to think that you know it's like our 18th year being a band but yet i feel very much still like a new band because yeah. there's so many there's so many people come to our shows that are watching us for the first time that's it's a, actually that's, insane uh, see that's like, it's interesting because you know obviously after the pandemic it was a it was a huge reset for a lot of people in a lot of ways you know like we didn't have music you know didn't have live music for so long um bands couldn't release music the way they wanted to they obviously couldn't tour it i think that it was like a bit of a a reset in not only the way that uh that you know bands release music and tour music but also the way that people consume it because obviously through that period we had things like this like that's why this channel started as we've said a million times as through COVID I couldn't play music he couldn't go and watch music it sucked we said let's talk about music on the internet and it, it's just given this whole new like resurgence to so many of these scenes that seemed like they were on their last legs almost um yeah have you guys with that reset noticed like you said new people at these shows do you feel like it's kind of a second chance to to rekindle that initial sort of drive that you guys had Yeah, I, th- I think that's a really interesting way you've unpacked that in the sense that, like, again, like, I didn't realise during that period in the pandemic that there was, like, a complete renaissance of this whole scene. Um, and, like, I think when there's always, like, a, a triggering thing, and I think the fact that my Ken came back um, mm. and then uh, All That Boy you know, came back with another album and a good album. Paramore but came back with an album. Like, I think that it just meant that <clears throat> kind of trickled down, I guess. And like, um, yeah, I felt very much like when we first started touring again, it was like, there was, I think people are taking maybe some of even their favorite bands for granted a little bit, you know, and like, oh, I get to see them, you know, every 18 months or at least every year, whatever it might be. Yeah. I mean, I think when you have that, realization that you know that wasn't the way it was going down i mean that we're we're some of the markets we're doing on the aussie run like we're you know selling better than we've sold in a long time if not ever so 
you know, I think that kind of, I know that's also reflecting the fact that we have a great package on the tour. We set it off in between you and me, but like, you know, I think there's a lot of uni fans that either haven't seen the band for eight, and I think it's like early doors. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to to being able to to do it down down there, and I think that you know, the the it definitely refocused us as a band. And I remember the first show that that we did was in Manchester and it was like 2000 people. And I don't think I'd even been in a room that had more than like fucking 30 people in it for yeah. fucking ages. <laughs> so like you go in there and there's like 2000 mad camps just going mad for it. And I, was, I remember, remember even saying, I said that I was like, the energy in this room tonight is like something I've never seen in my life. So that's awesome. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, wicked. It's really. You touched yeah. before on having the opportunity to take some chances in songwriting and that people have come along on the journey with you for those. Have there been any chances yeah. you've taken that people haven't been as responsive to, but you guys keep doing just because you like it? Yeah, fucking loads. <laughs> I like that. That's the short fucking answer. Fucking <laughs> loads, mate. Examples then, please. Uh, I think that's, you know, again, um, all right, I would say as a whole, I think that there's a couple of like moments or night people where people, fans were stoked, like songs like Give and maybe Take On The World and maybe one or two others but generally speaking that record didn't really do anything for us um our record six did absolutely nothing for us um although there's like songs like straight to my head in there which people still love when we play live but i don't know it's tough i just i but i also think that like it was like a oh you mean picking out another album okay okay and, and sucker punch it was like i think we were we were talking about those albums for so long before people heard them. I think there was yeah. a real kind of excitement about it and about what it could look mm-hmm. like. Um, and yeah, I just think that, but I think that's look. Even uh, all of all of our favorite bands have missed an open goal at some point, right? It's like Foo Fighters are still one of my favorite bands of all time. I don't. It's not every time they put out a record they go fucking smash that. Do you know what I mean? And then yeah, like, for sure. That new one, I'm like, fucking hell. Wow. Like my friend, me and my friend were listening to it the night. I was like, listen to absolute belters in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's just kind of, you never know. You never know when and when and how maybe that record might come back into your life and it might become your favorite record of all time. It's like, you know, music subjective, obviously in that sense. And I think sometimes that's why when a band or an artist hit, hit the sweet spot of like making a great record, but at the time that people need that kind of record or looking for that kind of record. Yeah. Um, man, how can it, how it can explode? I mean, I'm seeing that with that band, Bad Omens, you know, it's like people have been waiting for like a, I don't know, like a kind of scene sounding band to smash it and might make a great record and put out this album, it's just gone absolutely wild for them. It is, it is a great record, but you know, for me, it kind of happened overnight, which is really exciting. It's, it's a testament to how good the album is and how it's connected with people. So it's in, it's always one of those things that when it happens and when you put out a record and you realise that it's a bit, it's performed a bit underwhelming or you feel that when you play it live and you're like, oh, yeah, it's totally, we're going to start the set with a new song and then no one gives a shit. Like, yeah. it's <laughs> like, oh, Okay, but then it's good because you know at the end of the day you you check yourself because you you don't make albums with the guarantee that people are going to feel the same way about it as you do, which then makes it even more special when that does happen. So yeah, you know on 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 Truth Decay on the tour we we've been doing like we start the set the deep cuts and it's like you know it feels like one of the biggest moments in the set is that song or like you know um, I remember when we. Heartless had only been out for like a week and we're playing it on our UK tour and like everyone knew the words. And was... Yeah, sick. That whole album Super though, like fun. you touched yeah. on it before. <laughs> it's frozen. We got you. We've lost you. Oh, sorry. There we go. Yeah, no. there we yeah, go. Yeah, we got you back. back. 
Yeah, you touched on it before about um, Truth Decay being a, um, you know, like kind of like you, your intention was like a nostalgia album. And as soon as that song kicks in, though, as soon as that first track kicks in, like you said, it's got it's got some different flavors in there, but it is a nostalgia album. And there's so many songs on there that do remind me of when I first heard you guys, but in the best way. And not like a copy. It's not like we're doing it again because we know it was successful. It's like it's more a, oh, they can still do this and make it sound fresh and make it sound fun. And yeah, it's it just like credit to you guys because it's a really, really fucking solid rock album start to finish. Like there's not a bad song on there. It's really catchy. Um, there's some cool aggressive moments. There's some poppier moments, some almost indie moments. I think you've sort of cherry picked the best parts out of a lot of your catalogue. Is that also something that you did intentionally? Absolutely, yeah. And, and thank you for for your words, man. It was it was it was very much that uh, we spent a lot of time talking about who you meet six and what you meet six was to us, both individually and collectively. And I think we landed on the fact that um, the band needs to have a great you meet six record needs to have an abundance of energy. Um, Sorry, my dog is deciding what now is playtime. <laughs> Little fucker. Um, <laughs> we're off, mate. Um, and um, so, yeah, um, an abundance of energy, it needs to have um, aggression, and but then it also needs to be like measured aggression. And like it, you know, and I think that was one of those things is that we discovered when we listened, we basically listened to our whole back catalogue and we were like, how do we? how do we bring in all of the the aspects of this band that makes us feel like that's our identity? Because I'm Sucker Punch, as I said, very versatile record, but I've, I've always referred to it as a bit of a car crash in the record in terms of, you know, if you put, they're all like islands, and the only reason they work is because they're under the UMIT 6 umbrella, but other yeah. than that, like, like five or six different bands on that record. Um, and I just really wanted us to kind of, yeah, as I said, just like reestablish who who we are to us and who we believe we are to others and like our fans. And and I guess also understand like, you know, we, we there was a period of time where we were known as like, oh yeah, that, they're that emo pop punk band from the UK, right? Whereas like the last couple of records, it's like, I don't know who they are. I don't know what they're up to. I don't know what yeah. the story is. And I think, yeah, we just wanted to bring in something that was just felt familiar enough that people would be, um felt like they rediscovered their favorite band but foreign enough that it wasn't like as you say like just with that you music's karaoke because there's nothing that frustrates me more when you know and i but i also think actually something you touched upon earlier on that like when when a band bases their career on doing one thing then they never really move past that and they end up just standing still and we've tried not to stand still as much as often but as as often as possible but I think with this one we wanted to go backwards we wanted to find uh and redefine what U Music was to us so yeah I think in the end we basically ended up bringing pulling all the the things that we thought were valuable from the band's back catalogue onto one album um I think the only thing that we're missing on Truth Decay is like some big like epic ballad which we did have, but then we canned it like the week before we went to mix oh, and master. Um, How come? Just didn't think it would fit. It just, yeah. It for me, it, it didn't. It didn't do. It didn't do what I wanted it to do. So, yeah. If it doesn't, and also like I, I just thought the standard was too high for something that was like kind of okay. I'd okay. rather like if you want to hear us do a slow jam, they can just listen to take on the world or crash or no one's a better or yeah you've got a b-side you know. as well that you can release <laughs> that's <laughs> it yeah, deluxe yeah, reissue yeah, there's, there's always the uh, japan needs a b-side or yeah something. that's it that, that's, that's the thing like, isn't yeah. it like with every release they need to have an exclusive track or something i think someone said that to me once yeah or it used to be yeah. like that yeah 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 oh well, yeah exactly it's it's an it's on, ongoing uh, ongoing joke, really. To be I can't about. I can't wait until they get the deluxe edition with that ballad at the end of it, and then they watch this interview. 
<laughs> they realize he's just well, given us a piece of shit he doesn't like. All 50 of our Japanese guys. Yes. Uh, I want to yeah. go back to yeah. you listening to your back catalog. Where were you when you did that? Yeah. Did you listen to it in the car? No, so, so we we basically, when we first started writing, we went and did like a couple of Airbnb trips and we just set up like three or four studios in the house. We did various sounds and we were in like Cornwall and Devon and somewhere else. Um, and it would be like whilst we're like making food at night time, we like put on like old Jimmy records and like, you know, there's a lot of skipping. Um, <laughs> but like, yes, just, yeah, like just trying to like, I don't know. I, just, I, I kind of, I think the thing that I kept on saying to the band was like, what do you even like about the band you play in? Yeah. Like what do you, what do you think it is that we offer that others don't? Or what do you think it is that we offer that is, again, something that many are bringing to the table, but what do you think we do well or so well that it's different and makes us stand out? But it's like, you know, when you get to the crux of it, it was, um, I think if anything, it's brought us even, I mean, we're already, it's pretty well documented that we're like a really close band and like we've been the same lineup since our inception. Um, and, you know. That's incredible, we, by the way. Not not many bands yeah. can say that. <laughs> No, and I think that's you know I mean there's a lot of there's there's not there's a there's a handful out there that I know of that are but also like honestly there's not many bands that that I that I've toured with that they hang out you know it's almost like the only time you see them all in one place is when they absolutely have to be and that's on stage on stage whereas like <laughs> you know, which is like we really we really do move as a unit you know and um, I'm very proud of that and I know that the Matt Dan. Max and Chris are as well, that they they feel like if our two things were to, if our two main mission statements were longevity, but then also um, to preserve our friendships and for them to grow and, you know, like, then I think we've accomplished both those things. And, you know, Max's mum and dad are having like a big unit six family barbecue in a couple of weeks, where it's yeah. like all, all five families, the siblings, the the partners, the fucking kids, whatever. And it's like the dogs. Yeah, the dogs shitting on the barbecue. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that doesn't happen like normally, but like, you know, it's, there's not many bands that I know that are tight in that sense. But um, so it was it was cool to get a real feel of like why Chris loves Uni at Six and what he wants from a Uni at Six record versus just being like, we've got the blinkers on, let's just fucking do it. Let's just come on, and shut up. Let's just right, let's get on with that. It's like, how do we make this so everyone feels good about it? So that's a really cool we, thing to do to like, as you say, ask yourselves, what do we like about the band we're in? I hadn't heard anyone in the music scene kind yeah. of look at it like that. I, I, social media is like what I do for work outside of this. And that's one of the things when I like mentor people has been like, would you follow your own page? That's like my first piece of advice. I haven't heard mm. from a music standpoint and that's sick. Like, I think it's really cool hearing someone be like, what do I like about the music I make? That's yeah. right. It's yeah. funny, I um, recently, just on that, it's funny you say that because I recently watched a video that uh, the one of the blokes from the punk band Propagandy put up and um, he's like, oh, someone said to me that it'd be a really good idea if I go back and do a reaction essentially and and listen to our very first album and and see how I feel about it now. And he goes, all right. So he made it seem really serious. Like, let's go, let's get into it. Here we go. I oh, don't know how I'm going to feel about this. And he presses play and like three seconds of music plays and he goes, what the fuck is this shit? And turns it off. That's brutal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, yeah. The thing is, is, this, is like whenever I say that, whenever I listen to like Take Three Colors, for example, like our first record, it's like all I hear in that, it's just like, I just hear my, I hear my youth. I hear, I, I instantly go back to like the house parties we were at. I go back mm. to the local shows and like, I've never had a problem playing old songs. I'm not necessarily throwing shade and saying it's something the lads do, but I just feel that like, you know, I think there is something about the fact that we haven't just like based even our set lists around our first couple of records, which has meant that we've allowed to grow. We've allowed almost songs that come later on down the line to become the bigger songs if that makes yeah. sense because they're being almost force fed <laughs> so our fan base like you will like this eventually <laughs> you um, will tolerate this for now <laughs> yeah exactly you will tolerate it and moan about it in the back of the menu but you will buy a t-shirt on the way out well, yes, have some <laughs> um, and, and um but no it's yeah I, I always 
I, I've, I, yeah, I listen to our music regularly enough that, you know, I understand what it is to be, um, you know, aware of where we come from. And I think that's the other thing that we said a lot of, of during this process with Truth to Care is like, you can't possibly know where you're going to go if you don't really understand where it is you've been. And I think that's what we talked a lot at length about with the record. And, you know, I, there's, I don't, I don't harbor any sort of like, embarrassment or anxiety about whether or not people think we were cringe or we think we we're cringe or whatever because like every part of the our story has had to happen exactly the way it has for us to be where we are today otherwise it wouldn't have done wouldn't have gone that way so we we, we need to experience all the the good but also equally all the bad that we've experienced over the last 18 years because that shaped the yeah, band's history you know and it's made us who we are so yeah um, but on that, what do you think your cringiest song is? Or also, what's one song you never get to play that you want to play? I'll give you a positive and a negative there. Okay. Um, one song, one song. Um, I think that one of the cringiest songs we have is probably a song like, it's not, I'm, saying, it's not saying it is the cringiest, but like the Sweet Feet <laughs> or nasty habits or just something like just so fucking middle of the road basic um and like you, i'm like sort of like doing this like really whiny nursery rhyme stuff that is just sounds and i sound young on some on tape Car as well like really young I, sound like I, do, I actually older. listened to the album the other day and i thought the exact same thing because i was showing my fiance your yeah. she'd never heard of you guys before sorry uh and i'll like, say well, i'm gonna go watch you're gonna come along with this you'll like it so i was playing some new stuff and then older stuff came on she's like is this the same guy yeah. i was like oh that's really interesting from like a fresh perspective to hear that she she didn't know it was the same person <laughs> uh mate it's, it's wild because again i forget that i was like first of all we made that record in two weeks time in two weeks like in our friend's studio and i was 16 when i recorded all those vocals and i think wow. you can hear it it's, it's a kid yeah you know trying to do it um but what i would say is from that kind of era of like tech colors or a hold me down i think there was like songs like if you run which i when we did a we did a technical colors bunch of shows in england and whenever we did the mid late of if you run i was like this is fucking sick this can stay yeah that's um, cool just the, the rest of the song's pretty trash but the mid late's really cool um <laughs> uh and yeah there's a couple of hold me down like contagious chemistry or um fireworks i miss playing because i always think that was a really beautiful song but yeah we have, we have a very kind of um prevalent reasons to why we can't play that um and then yeah i don't know we, we it's you know i think eight times there's what, about 90 songs out there for the world to hear so there's a lot to kind of pick from um so yeah you i'm said... looking forward to people in the future kids and all that sort of stuff we did yeah you talked about how close you guys are if there's anything that is where you might come to loggerheads is it writing a set list after having so many albums and how do you guys go about choosing that now because surely you dudes can't always all agree on the set list no basically it and this isn't a criticism it's just an observation but um i have completely given up on those set list conversations. Um, I thought because... you were going to say what I say goes and the other yeah, that just I have yeah, complete yeah. control. <laughs> this is no, 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 no. I've, I've, I've given up because it becomes too stressful and I'm not going to name names and I love him and he knows I love him, but there's a there's a, an element of laboring a point relentlessly that you feel like you're in a chokehold. You're like, fuck it. We'll just, do, we'll just do that because I can't have this conversation anymore. So as far as I'm concerned, as long as we play the obvious ones, hmm. it, if there's a couple of like oddballs that you want to bring in and out, whatever, great. But the best thing about that is if you don't get involved in that conversation, if it goes great, you can go, mate, what a fucking shout that was. You were right about that song. If it doesn't, you can turn around and go, see, I told you. Oh, well, well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, why, why, why have you, why have you, why do you think you're the set list master? So we've got a couple of set list masters in our, in our band. Um, <laughs> but to be, to be honest, it's, it's, it's the possible, the possible thing is like, 
some songs might work really, really great, say in England, but then going and playing um, that same set and it being taking place in fucking Poland where you've only played three times uh, and they're, all, they're always constantly new fans at these shows. They're not like old school fans. It's like people that only know the last two albums pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They really like They've never heard those songs properly. So it's an interesting one. But um, yeah, I just try and, I try and keep out of it because I don't really care I know that people are going to, as long as we're on a good form and, you know, giving it, then people are going to have a good time. And also, I, I'm also the person who wants to play a lot more older stuff. So, okay. um, That's interesting coming from a vocalist because a lot of vocalists look at their older stuff like really critically and, and they're like, oh, that wasn't how I sounded. I don't sound like that now. My lyrics weren't great. Whereas a guitarist can be like, oh, yeah, I wrote sick riffs forever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, and that, well, that's the other thing is that I, I, what I, what I say to to the lads whenever I do chime in about our set list, and which I probably they'll probably if when they hear this they're like, what is he fucking on about? All he does is talk about the set list and what he thinks we can play. So maybe I've got this really warped perception of what actually happens. I'm a total narcissist, but um, <laughs> which is probably close to the truth, to be honest. Um, yeah, yeah. I call him the fantastic Josh for nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, but I, I, I'm so sick and tired of going and seeing my favorite bands or bands that I really love and them just having this weird entitlement that like they're above playing their older, bigger songs because, oh, I don't want to play that anymore because it's fucking 10 years old. Get over it. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't want to spend X amount of money on a ticket and watch you play an hour of self-indulgent, you know, the, yeah. the new album which has sold five copies like it's kind of a waste of time so I always say that like you know I would I would rather have that feeling on stage of oh that song's coming up that's going to be a bit right for me but if the room is loving it then I don't care yeah. because it's not the, the, me being on stage is not about me it's about you're there to entertain people you're there to provide escapism you're there to kind of create a, an environment which people come here and spend their hard-earned money to enjoy them fucking selves, not to come and, you know, stand around and go, oh, I wish... And I had it the other day, I'm not going to say which band it was, but I waited the whole set. This is like, it's a fucking hot as balls day at this festival, and this is the song that I'm hearing. All of my friends, with it, we've been waiting for like the last 40 minutes to play a song, and then they ended on a fucking cover. Um, oh, um, that would piss me off too, dude. I, I, literally, I was like, nah, you're done. You're nah, never again. You are done. So... Um, Dude, like the you need to that, name names here, but yeah, the way. we want to know. I can't uh, have you walk away with nothing there. The thing that pisses me off is when a band has like six, seven, eight albums and they do two or three covers in the set. It's like that was some forty one. Some forty one we saw them last time put three covers in their set list. I think didn't didn't Papa Roach do it as well? I don't know. Either Recently, way, it's too many. It's like too many. Dude, like, I don't need to hear you play The Cure or fucking Metallica. Like, just play your fucking songs, man. I know this sounds really bad, and I'm not going to say again which band I heard saying this, but I was literally in a room the other day where they were talking about creating viral TikTok moments, and that's why their band was playing covers in their set list. And I was just like, I just don't understand where we've got to that that's what it's about. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you've got, like you're saying, this huge decorated archive of songs that you can pull into that are yours and your fans want to see that why are you playing fucking skater boy by Avril Lavigne and like, what are you doing yeah like I want Avril to do that I don't want to hear you do it if I thought you're a bloke do you know what I mean like it's that kind of level of, of bullshit but there you go it's um not for me not for everyone but you know maybe playing underdog for the millionth time isn't for the universe, so, yeah. yeah if you don't play that in Sydney I'm gonna be pissed bro <laughs> <laughs> but uh, be stoked when you play so skater boy we, there you go. That's it. Well, we had that in America where after the first couple of nights we were supporting a 1K rock over in America last last year and Max just comes on stage one day and goes, I'm not playing underdog anymore. And I went, what do you mean? He's like, no one in the audience knows who we are and they're not going to care if we don't play it and I'm not playing it. And I went, all right, that's not that anymore. So for, the, for like the first time in our whole career since it's come out, we've been playing underdog for like 
a month worth of touring and it was weird when we then got, got back into the UK and started playing. I was like, oh, what's this? <laughs> oh, goodness. <What's> this? <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, it, 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 it would be great in Australia because um, that's someone who's not gone down well for us over there. So, well, man, we're really looking forward to having you back out here. And you are, you, you bring it out a really tight package too. It's mm. You've got a fun lineup. It's going to be a, a hell of a show. We're looking forward to getting you out here. We'll have to get some hang time in when, you, when you're in Sydney. Yeah, I've been saying, um, let Tiana and I will get you guys in and have some beers or whatever. Sounds good, man. Beautiful. We'll let you get into it the rest of your day. Good luck with the dog. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I hope he heals up fine and he's happy and shit-free. <laughs> shit-free. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for hanging, man. Yeah, Great thank chat. you both for your time and I'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. See you Sounds then. Good, man. See you, dude. Legend. Take care. Bye-bye.